these meme coins aren't like distracting your users, right? It's kind of maybe some tough love, but like it's not distracting your users. Your product is just not good enough. Okay? If it were, people would pay attention to it as well. The meme coin can actually help you. I think it's super uh, zero sum in most cases, but you can also use it like some teams did with Bonk, like for, with Saga, where you can leverage the attention that it's getting to sell a, uh, uh, your product or draw attention to your services or whatever that may be. All right, everyone, this episode is brought to you by Monad, an L1 bringing performance to the EVM with parallel execution and both a custom consensus engine and new database solution. You'll hear more about them later in the show. Before we get moving on today's episode, just a quick disclaimer. The views expressed on this podcast by either myself, my co-host, or any guests are their personal views and do not represent the views of any associated organization. Nothing in the episode should be construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or any other advice. Okay, let's jump into the episode. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Lightspeed. We are recording today's episode on March 5th and have a great conversation lined up for you. Just kind of recapping the latest market happenings. You know, first and foremost, new Bitcoin all time high. Uh, (laughs) We kissed it on the chart and then had a nice pullback. Uh, But nonetheless, history was made yet again. Uh, And it's really been Bitcoin and some of the majors kind of leading this rally uh, with the sole exception of the meme coin category category. Every meme coin seems to be up 25, 20% every single day. Uh, and we've had some interesting things occur, like Bonk flipping Celestia, Sui, uh, Say as well, and kind of really making this crazy run up to the multi-billion dollar number. And it's it's funny, like when I pull up, uh, pull up the chart and and like look at these things. The numbers are so ridiculous when you look at like Dogecoin from last cycle topping out around forty billion dollars. And yeah, I'm already getting those texts from my normal friends that are coming back, and you know they're like, "Hey, like crypto's you know going up again. Like, what should I buy?" Like, those are the scariest texts in the world for me. Um, but everybody asks about the meme coins, and, and Mert, I just want to get your take on what, like, what do you think about meme coins? Like, what does this mean for the industry? I, I feel like there's there's really two sides to this. There's people that love them and thinks it's just the purest form of human degeneracy, and there's people that hate them and you know are like, "This is." you know, setting us back and it's, it's stupid and it's a regression of such powerful technology. So I'm curious where you lie on that spectrum. You know, the, the way I, so I used to hate meme coins. Um, and I think most engineering types probably hate them at mo uh, at first at least. And probably most of them still do because, you know, you get into this industry, you're like, oh, okay, I want to work on cool distributed systems and cryptography and, but people are just gambling and everybody cares about the price even though the tech sucks and price can salvage something with awful tech but good tech might get ignored that's kind of the usual engineering dilemma where people get mad at like the sales guy or the marketing guy uh, as the engineer so that that happens um pretty or that that happens pretty uh, pervasively in just culture and in tech in general um and basically what i realized was like okay People like memes are actually have been around for a long time, like thousands of years, really. Um, memes really are just like these ideas that propagate socially, right? And uh, and like aren't based on like physical law or something like that, right? Like gravity is not a meme. Everybody knows you can do predictable things about it. Uh, money is kind of a meme, right? It's kind of a collective idea that people have to all believe in uh, that gets passed down. Um, it is obviously useful. Uh, where memes might not be useful. But like basically since, I mean, since I was in school, which is, I guess, since 2000, like 10 10 years ago, et cetera, like there's always been like these memes, like the Harlem Shake or the Cinnamon Challenge and all these different things or like the cats on the internet. Uh, These things have always kind of happened. But for the first time ever, you get to bet on them right? Memes are not financialized. And is it zero sum? Well, it's kind of zero sum, uh, but not fully zero sum, right? Like there's what, what, what so for example, uh, I'm going to give you the example of Bonk and how that worked on Solana. So Bonk is like, people think it's a meme coin, but really it's kind of like a stealth startup in a sense of a bunch of early Solana people who saw that the chain was like struggling, right? Through, uh, through, 2022 December, right? Like uh, in the aftermath of FTX. 
And they pulled together money and they started just doing a very well distributed airdrop, right? Uh, I was able to distribute it to like Lamport DAO developers, uh, you know, quite a few of them, which at the time was worth about $900 and now is worth about 700000 uh, I don't think anybody held though, uh, including myself or my co-founders. Um, and so that that was like a meme coin slash startup where the meme or the virality aspect of it actually helped the startup and it actually helped save the chain in some sense, right? Like it also helped sell a lot of Solana phones and now there's a second kind of saga to that, no pun intended. Um, and uh, it, it got integrated into a bunch of DeFi apps. It got a lot of different DeFi protocols, different uh, or more users, new users, more attention from the outside, from other chains, people bridged and more people started using the chain. So it can be used for good, for sure. And Bonk is like the one example that I've seen where I'm like, okay, this is clearly a net good for the chain. Now, of course, as with anything like this, most of the attempts are going to be awful and horrible. And that's kind of the same as like startups, like 99% of startups fail. Well, 99.99999% of meme coins are probably scams. Uh, but there's obviously a very few that are fine. Um, and but but the thing I want to maybe uh, just quickly touch on is like a lot of people get disencouraged or disappointed or whatever salty that they're builders and they've built cool tech, but then now these meme coins are just totally taking the spotlight from them and they're making money some guy like they picked the wrong career now like they start having this identity crisis and basically what i would say is like um these meme coins aren't like distracting your users right so kind of maybe some tough love but like it's not distracting your users your product is just not good enough okay if it were people would pay attention to it as well right it's not like there is this finite amount of where people must pick between your product and meme coins. It's just that when they go throughout their everyday life, they see the meme coins like, this is interesting to me. If your product was useful to them, they would also use it. So, you know, the fact that you don't have traction does not have anything to do with the meme coin. Okay. The meme coin can actually help you. Like, I don't think it's, I think it's super uh, zero sum in most cases, but you can also use it like some teams did with Bonk, like for, with Saga, where you can leverage the attention that it's getting to sell a, uh, uh, your product or draw attention to your services or whatever that may be. Um, so anyway, that's kind of my take on it. We, we can link the post I wrote on it uh, from a while ago, but the TLDR is I think they're, it's, they're inev inevitable. Like memes will be around at all times in human history. Uh, and you can, as a builder, you can try to use them for drawing attention to your stuff. Um, some meme coins might be useful, like Bonk, um, but but um, they're also. Oh, by the way, uh, they're a really good stress tester for the network. Because, uh, uh, like with Solana, for example, we noticed a lot of different issues that the chain uh, was having due to the meme coins alone, and we actually found out the first set of Solana problems like two years ago during the NFT craze. Right, NFTs revealed that Solana had some weird spam problems that uh, the core team didn't think about because they just didn't think NFTs would be a thing. Uh, and it actually really helps improve the chain. It's an insanely uh, uh, efficient uh, uh, load test. And you can also kind of see this with inscriptions breaking like literally every single blockchain in existence. Uh, it's th These things are like, it's, it's like, why not stress test the living hell out of your systems with these things that are just jokes and fun? before the nation states and the very, very serious financial rails, et cetera, come onto the chain. So, you know, I, I think it's overall just have fun. Okay, guys, quick break from the episode to talk to you about Monad, the L1 optimizing the performance of the EVM. The team is working to materially advance the efficient frontier in the trade-off between decentralization and scalability. The internal devnet is currently live and public testnet is coming soon. And testing on the internal devnet uh, indicates that the chain can handle up to about 10,000 transactions per second, significantly increasing the throughput capabilities of the EVM. 
This, of course, opens doors for new applications and more interesting use cases, even those with greater complexity and higher usage, to run in a decentralized manner. Importantly, Monad is fully compatible with the EVM and the Ethereum RPC API, which provides EVM developers with the seamless portability for their applications. Given the popularity of the EVM today, this is really a no-brainer. To stay up to date with all of the latest developments, join the Monad community by following them on Twitter and jumping in the Discord. They're a lively bunch, so hit the links in the description below. All right, let's get back to the episode. I loved your flag on uh, Bonk. It, it had such a crazy origin story, as you mentioned, and it really has become a stealth startup. Like the, the they launched Bonk Bot, which is like a trading bot on Solana, uh, and then during the December uh, Bonk, the days of Bonk Miss, which is like their incentive program, it was seeing like north of 60, 50, 50 to sixty million dollars uh, in, in transaction volume on this Bonk Bot, and and it, it was getting you know some 40,000 active addresses, uh, you know, using it. And uh, as last episode mentioned, you can't just say users on top of ad- active addresses. But uh, when you compare that to some of the other trading bots, like they were dominating the market share uh, over there. And uh, my favorite dashboard is from Whale Hunter on Dune that attracts us. And I just pulled it up, and unfortunately, it's down. So I, I was going to show these stats, but um, that uh, it, uh your, the other line of reasoning you had gives me another thought and. What percentage of on-chain users, so not just people like you know trade buying you know ten dollars of Bitcoin from Coinbase, what percentage of on-chain users have traded a meme coin, and the other the other side of that is used a DeFi application? Like, I, I wonder what that split is because I, I have to believe that uh, more people have interacted with meme coins than any other market sector in, in our industry, which. For better or for worse, is is just kind of how I'm how I'm thinking about this. Yeah, I think uh, that seems pretty reasonable. Meme coins for sure. I mean, I know people who don't understand crypto in any way who understand Shiba and Doge, hundred percent. Right? And same thing with NFTs. Like you could argue that the last cycle, like last big one, the two thousand one, was really kicked off by NFTs, like NBA Top Shot and Board Apes, Crypto Punks, etc. It's interesting because those fun ways of interacting with things on chain, one, lead to more technological improvements on the chain itself. Um, and then two, onboard people to use the chain because it's just attention is attention, right? Um, we obviously have to do much better at security and uh, helping people not get scammed, which I, I I do think we'll get better at. I mean, the internet in its early days was full of scams as well. Uh, scammers are very fast, but I think there's a lot of startups and and solutions being worked on here to help people. Like we were talking about to to remember uh, Drip in the last episode, where he said they have two different wallets: one for like the more beginner type, one for the self custody like uh, uh, maxi type. And so I think like at the at the very least, I th- like the biggest problem would be indifference, like. Even with meme coins, nobody gave a shit about crypto. That'd be a problem. This I'll take because it still helps. I mean, there's obviously a market for it. The market might not be the one that people want, which is like maybe a more speculation casino-based market. Okay, sure. But that is a market. And like that also does lead to different branches of advancement that you can kind of follow Right, like Solana is a better chain because of meme chains today. I mean, I mean, I mean, meme coins today, right? Like uh, the and we'll get to kind of the MEV stuff, right? Like, but like it exposes problems with the fee markets, for example. It exposes problems with like spam and block leaders. Um, uh, in fact, NFTs on Solana were what inspired compression on Solana, which has now made Solana the most efficient chain for minting large scales of dis- large scale digital assets. Right. So these things are they seem very like stupid and, and meme and like they're literally like you shouldn't take them too seriously, they're just memes. But like they have a funny way of actually really helping the chain um in ways you wouldn't expect. Yeah, that's a valid point. Uh and you mentioned MEV there. Uh and that's definitely a valid case here. If we rewind to pre uh well, we're still in the heat of the bear market. I think it was like when when Pepe first launched. Uh, Jared from Subway turned up on Ethereum, and for those unfamiliar, Jared from Subway was a sandwich bot that had a different, slightly different style of, of um, MEV, uh, where it was taking like inventory risk and actually holding these meme coins, which is pretty unusual for most sandwich bots. Um, 
And he was absolutely demolishing everybody on every trade. And for anyone who's traded a meme coin, especially on Ethereum mainnet, you know, you, uh, you have to like manually set your slippage to something, some ridiculous number. And you're basically accepting that that's actually the price you're going to end up getting. Um, and, and when we say that, right, if I'm, you know, say I'm swapping a thousand dollars for a thousand dollars of a meme coin, you know, I'll set my slippage tolerance to say five, five, five percent, meaning I'm allowing myself to get a five percent worse quote uh, on this trade than the, the number that's being reflected to me on the UI. Um, you know, in a very deep pool, like say, you know, Solana for for USDC, that's not really going to be a problem. The the pool is is quite deep, and there's plenty of liquidity. Uh, whereas these meme meme cool meme coin pools move so quickly uh, because there's so many competing trades in each block that uh, that is a problem. And this really opens the door for MEV. And Ethereum's long had this problem. Um, it's figured out a way to kind of recycle it through the ecosystem that results in more ETH burn, uh, which was their like. Band-Aid solution. Uh, I don't know if it's a long-term solution, but it does at least give some positive effect to some aspect of your ecosystem rather than it just occurring. Um, and Solana is now in the in the kind of the same boat of like, okay, this MEV certainly exists today. Uh, well, what are we going to do about it? And it's a very it's probably one of the hardest problems to solve. Like, I, I don't I don't think it's just like an answer anyone can point to. Um, and it's a very complex issue, right? And like the most basic form of MEV is just sandwiching uh, a trade, right? So if I see Mertz uh, trade coming through, if it's in the mempool or in the case of Solana, um, if it's in a, I guess Jito kind of technically does make a mempool. Uh, so if it's in the mempool, I see Mertz order trying to buy a thousand dollars of Bonk. I see that and I can front run his order uh, and, and me end up with a profit and Mert end up with a worse price on his trade execution. And so... Eugene Chen from Ellipsis Labs, they're building Phoenix, the on-chain order book decks on Solana. He had a very interesting take on all of this, and he he tweeted out, Sandwiching on Solana has gotten really out of hand. It's pretty difficult to recommend Solana for shitcoining these days. Slippage tolerance is turning into guaranteed slippage if you get filled at all. And when asked about, you know, like, what can we do to fix this? It was His response was, remove third-party mempools. This should at least buy us a year or two of better UX. Not sure how to fix long term. And again, this is like very much, an, very much so an unsolved problem. Uh, but he was kind of pointing the finger at Jito here, uh, you know, indiscriminately. And I don't think in a negative way. I don't think there's any animosity between these teams, to be clear. But um, he was he was highlighting the fact that Jito has created a mempool which has allowed MEV to exist, and now it is having external. Um, negative impact on on Solana users and kind of curious to get your take on the MEV problem in, for Solana and like the MEV landscape and um, kind of like Eugene's thoughts around, you know, if we didn't have external uh, external parties creating a mempool, like Solana was originally designed without one and this really wouldn't be a, much of a problem. But yes and no, right? I, I think it's not just that straightforward. Yeah, there's a lot there. Um Okay, first, I, I think probably some portion of the audience won't really know what MEV is. So let me just quickly explain how that works on Solana. Um, so in like a blockchain like Ethereum, for example, when you send a transaction, what happens is it gets sent to a mempool uh, or like you could just think of it as some abstract container. It, it goes there and then people who are, you know, proposing the blocks or something like that uh, will pick have have these transactions within this mempool and maybe they'll reorder them in some way or pick whichever ones that they want to pick uh, to maximize their own profit or whatever incentive they have. Okay. And they can do that because um, uh, Ethereum has a mempool, right? Like this concept of a place where the transactions go. Uh, on Solana, what's different is there is no mempool. Okay. Like what happens on Solana is when you send a transaction, let's say to an RPC, the RPC directly sends it to the leader, the block leader, and like maybe the four, the sum is configurable, but it sends to n number of leaders after that as well. And so it, it goes directly to the leader. So the leader d gets all these things streamed, like the transactions are streamed to the leader instead of the transactions being sent somewhere and the leader can just pick whichever ones that he wants to front run or reorder in whatever way, right? Um, so, okay, that's how Solana works by design. And what Jito has done is they forked how Solana works, the Solana client, and they've added a, let's say they, they've added a, a mempool. So basically now it kind of works like how it would on Ethereum, 
where you send them to the leader and there's this there's this engine where it allows validators to kind of um, reorder these transactions in such a way to extract more profit. Okay. Um, so for example, like the example you gave is, you know, let's say um, me and Dan both submit a trade or let's say uh, Dan is the, the, the block leader and I bought, I want to buy a hundred million dollars worth of bonk. Okay. That's quite, quite a big buy, right? And Dan sees this and then he's like, wait a minute, I know this person's going to buy this and the price is going to go way up after he buys this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy it before him. Uh, and then uh, uh, like you'll profit from the price movement uh, that, that, that I caused. Right. And so that's like a very, very naive version of this. There's uh, people get super complex with this, uh, which I don't think, I don't think I'd be even able to explain uh, on a podcast, but, but so, Basically, now the the gist of this is that you can now do MEV on Solana, and this causes people to maybe get front run by bots or sandwiched by bots, um, MEV bots, and um, you know that's just a worse user experience, right? You you get worse prices. You might not get filled at all. Your orders might just hang. So, like uh, you said in the in the comment that Eugene was like, basically, well, the short term is probably social uh, a social fix. Um, what, what's, what's actually happened is I'm pretty sure there's actually a team that forked Jito as well. And this team forked Jito and is trying to offer better, uh, yield than Jito. And, and I say that because it brings up an interesting point, which is that MEV is kind of inevitable, right? Like it's, it doesn't matter that Jito has the mempool, like the, their client. It's like, if there was going to be activity worth having on Solana, somebody was going to come up with this at some point. Okay. So there's no avoiding it. It's kind of like a law, I would say, in, in some sense. Uh, I know like there's people who say, oh, you can eliminate Mav. It's like, no, you can't. Please. Okay. Um, you can reduce it. You can democratize it. You can do different things to it. Like you can leverage it, but you can't just remove it. Um, and so... Anyway, so if Jito weren't to do this, somebody else would have. And so I, you know, I think it's totally fine that Jito has done it because uh, if you know the co-founders, they're they're very uh, dedicated to Solana and they're smart people, good intentions. Uh, so I really like them. And you know, this they probably are trying to solve this problem more than anybody, right? Um, so I have no doubt about intentions or anything like that. Um, it is, you know, uh, now we just have to think of like, okay, what do we do? Right. Um, maybe there's an endpoint that Jito exposes to RPC providers, uh, and for user transactions only, they bypass the mempool, and maybe the bots get like a separate mempool treatment. Like something like that could be interesting. That's Some that is asked, interesting because Flashbots on Ethereum has something similar, uh, and I think CowSwap now has an, an RPC that basically won't, they're just saying, "Hey, send it here. We're not going to front run you," uh, and you kind of trust that that's the case, but. Uh, you know, you, you do have these people that are offering these services to kind of protect you uh, from these things. So I, I do think that's actually, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to, to cut in there and finish your thought, but that's a, that's, a, that's a great idea and something that doesn't exist on Solana today, to yeah. my knowledge. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So like, obviously, I run an RPC company and we, we do get requests for MEV protection and stuff like that, but um, I think we'll get there. Um, the, the first naive idea, like I, I think I heard was like, just figure out who the leader is and if they're running Jito and if they're not running Jito, then send it. But, you know, that has some weird issues with it. Um, but I think, anyways, I think that part is solvable uh, and I think we'll solve it and, or at least we'll make it better than it is today. Um, we also did an episode with Anatoly, uh, our last episode with Anatoly, where he talks about MEV. Uh, he has similar concerns uh, about it being like accessible to regular users and whatnot. Um so anyway, that's uh, I don't think I really answered anything there other than maybe paint a different picture. Um, but I think Eugene is right that it is quite wild right now. <laughs> like people do some uh, profit a lot from from this activity. Um, the the silver lining though is that uh, validators who are obviously helping secure the network do get rewarded for this, right? So. People people like to talk about Solana's value economics, but like now with MEV revenue, um, their revenues are increasing even more. And so it's becoming more and more attractive to be a validator on Solana. 
Um, so I don't think it's all bad. Yeah, no, that's that last point there, I think is super, super important because, you know, you you mentioned MEV is inevitable. And the reality is that's true. Uh, and it's because the incentives are there for it to be inevitable, right? Like if you are a validator, you make MEV, you make commission on the MEV tips that flow through the system if you run the GDO client or any MEV client, right? And so you have two options. Do or do not run this this MEV enabled client, and one path has higher uh, has a higher value than the other path. So uh, most validators are profit maximizing and interested in making money, uh, and of course that's how you you end up with running a MEV enabled client. I don't know the current number uh, of MEV or validators that run the Gito client off the top of my head, though. Do you know that by chance? I think it's just over half the total stake. Well, okay, something like that. I have forty five percent in my head, so that makes sense. Yeah. So, so something that I, I forgot to mention, uh, but but I'm I'm actually quite sure also that people were kind of uh, uh, used to have like off the backdoor deals where actually some of these validators would do MEV without the official Gito clients, and uh, so like <laughs> at least Gito is democratizing. It's an open source client; everybody can run it. Uh, but this actually used to kind of exist before as well. It's just a bit more uh, shadowy, let's say. So, you know, overall, these things are inevitable. They're growing pains. Ethereum had a ton of these and still do. And Solana, if it... And again, like some chains will like reply guy I me and be like, hey, we solved MEV because we randomized stuff. And it's like, okay, you what you did is you incentivize spam now. Um, and also... The reason you don't have MEV probably is because you don't have any economic activity on the chain, right? Like Solana did not have MEV that much over uh, when when it was at eight dollars, right? Like not that much. It has arbitrage, of course, but that's not necessarily the same thing. That's just that's just inevitable. But like here, uh, once and 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 the reason why we're bringing it up now is because meme coins, right? As meme coins drive the prices of certain assets, like those meme coins up or down. Uh, and you have volatility on chain, volatility just means opportunities for MEV. And if there is volatility and economic activity worth capturing, people will capture it. That's kind of what we mean. So um, anyway, tough problem. There is a uh, Umbra Research, if you're more in, if you're interested, Umbra Research has some posts on this, um, which I think is actually co-authored by Eugene and, and Gito. And... Um, we had Lucas come on before as well, and uh, we're actually at Helios. We're writing a post on this as well, which should be out within two weeks. Ooh, looking forward to that one. And and I will also nod towards those Umber research pieces. Those are required reading if you really want to learn more about Solana. Uh, it's written in pretty plain English, which is nice. Uh, it's not too like tech speak, which a lot of the Solana documentation can be uh, translating from engineer into English, but that's the fun of this. Um, but yeah, volatility is the key word for sure. I, I'm glad you brought that word up. That's that's definitely a, a hallmark of, of MEV opportunities. And then the other point you mentioned was out-of-network payments to validators, which that's a great flag. You know, that that is a, a huge relief of of why Gito is is important in the the democratization of these fees. Uh, anybody can stake to a Gito a, a validator running the Gito client and participate and get their share of these rewards that are flowing through the system. Um, whereas out of network payments, uh, do not let that happen. They go straight to the validator in their own pocket. And I'll explain what those are. And I think it's actually a good segue into kind of talking about Solana fees as a whole, uh, really just blockchain fees. So out of network payments are instead of or just you knowing who the leader is and saying hey i'm not going to include a priority fee on this transaction but it, you know instead um i'll just pay you and you can include that and it's better for me the user uh, because in this case i get to pay less as a total fee and it's better for the validator because they get to keep more of the total fee uh, and the reason that is is half the fees of in a solana transaction are burnt it doesn't it doesn't like segregate uh, the base fee and the priority fee um sorry the signer fee slash base fee whichever you prefer and, and the priority fee um it it doesn't dis like distinguish between those two it just says give me the total fee cut it in half Half goes to the validator and half gets burned. Uh, and this actually differs from the likes of, say, Ethereum, where the entire base fee uh, is burned and then the priority fees are what flows to the validator. Um, so Ethereum elected to, to burn that base fee. doesn't really matter what you do with it. The point is that like, it just can't go to the leader or else you can sort of like act maliciously. 
Um, burning it is like kind of like the easiest way to democratize it, if you will, though. Um, and so that's it's really interesting because, you know, if you're burning 50 percent of the total fee and, you know, a large majority of that is this priority fee, that is kind of how this, this incentive misalignment happens between a user and a validator. Uh, and so you can kind of I guess you can still technically use the GDO network for this. Um, you could just like send a bundle with one transaction in it that would kind of be like directly paying the validator. So maybe it's not perfect, uh, but it is a step in the right direction nonetheless. And Solana fees are a very interesting nut to crack. Again, this is where I would strongly suggest you, if you want to read more about the the layout and the future of these, is, is Umber Research. They do such a good job. We'll put a, a link in the show notes to that. But what's the latest, Mert? I, I know there's a scheduler issues as well, and that's coming in 118, Solana 118. I think you said that was about two months away. Uh, but what's the latest on the fee discussion these days? Maybe just recapping or starting from the top, Solana obviously has these things called uh, uh, priority fees. And the reason they were added is because uh, if you remember, I mentioned how Solana doesn't have a mempool and you just send stuff directly to the leader. Well, it's hard for the leader to prioritize things based directly. Uh, Like if it doesn't have a full picture of all the transactions being sent to it, and if if they're just being streamed, it's going to have a hard time prioritizing which ones to really use or, or to include to maximize their own profit. And so Solana, and by the way, this was discovered during NFT season, right? Uh, where people would sp- spam the living hell out of these uh, block leaders, such that the leaders would actually like kind of shut down, which uh, or get overwhelmed and not produce blocks. Um, so there was actually a lot of uh, like that's that was a major cause of outages, and uh, a few changes went live to prevent this from happening again. It hasn't happened since. Um, and one of those is kind of priority fees, which is where you just say, okay, uh, there's obviously a base fee that I need to pay, uh, per signature, but I can also give you some extra money such that you can prioritize my transaction. And that is, um, uh, like the idea is, um, the idea is let's say naive, but it kind of works, uh, but it, it has some issues with it. Um, one of the issues, and it has multiple issues, by the way, but one of the issues, and, and we had Eugene to talk about this, so if you want to check the previous episode we did on this, uh, he, he goes into great detail. One of the issues is that um, it's kind of jittery. So that is to say, let's say me and you both send a transaction to the leader. Mine has a fee, but yours doesn't. If you are like closer to the leader, first of all, that probably gives you a better chance of it getting included because it has less distance. Uh, but but also, there's also some like actual chance because there's threads that are um, um, being spun up by the leader, like the leader has some threads. And let's say there's there's four threads. Uh, the, 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 the one that mine got sent to might actually be like being uh, busy while yours might not be busy. Um, so there's actually like a weird probability distribution here. Uh, and I've seen this in our numbers as well at Helios you're generally better off using a fee like that will reduce your confirmation times and it will increase your chances, but it's not like a, like a perfect, like lossless kind of, uh, uh, um, correlation. So anyway, so there's some problems with that. And the, uh, and so knowing that what happens is bots during times of volatility, they span the chain, right? Because, well, first of all, Spamming the chain might still be a better strategy than actually paying the fees, right? And so they're going to keep spamming. Um, but then when they spam the chain, well, one, some user transactions get uh, left out. Um, but also, well, it, the economics of the validators don't start making less sense, right? Because they're not able to, um, they, they lose it on some fees, right? Uh, but then also... Um, there's a lot of failed transactions, right? Because most arbitrage transactions are actually failed transactions, which is where you see that Solana has like 50% failed transactions or something. Um, so that's already, I just, I just listed off three problems. Um, and um, anyway, so there's there's all those types of problems. And what, what needs to happen is, so what Anatoly thinks happen, should happen is he has this proposal with, with Tao, who's like a core engineer at Anza, uh, called uh, SIMD 110, right? Slot improvements documents 110. 
And basically, it's back pressure for bots, right? So like it becomes more expensive for them to spam the chain. Um, in a sense, it's more detailed than that. And some people disagree with this approach, right? They don't think that um, you should introduce this 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 penalty, this this uh, exponential fee for for spamming the chain. What you should actually do is you should make it such that the leaders can control the network a bit better, like accept, like uh, determine who, uh, um, how they, what connections to accept. Like they can just rate limit people if they're being spammed, right? So uh, you need a network protocol for this. Currently, Solana uses something called Quick, um, right? It's a networking protocol. And I think the Fire Dancer team kind of thinks this is a bad protocol from what I've seen to say the least. Um, so I think they want to actually rewrite it and some other people want to do that too. And so you kind of have these two different, uh, approaches and, and, and well, actually the probably the, the real approach is you probably need to do both, right? You, you do need economic back pressure. You also probably need a better networking protocol. Um, and, um, what, what's, and then another fix that's coming out, which is probably the much more important one for the near future is in Solana's next release called 1.18. Uh, um, there's the, the scheduler. So the thing that schedules how the transactions will be scheduled, uh, uh, it's becoming more deterministic. There's a whole post on this and I can't do it justice in just a simple, you know, podcast episode, but, uh, basically it, it tries to, uh, reduce randomness and it makes it a bit more deterministic such that you're per, when you, you know, when you have input X, you get output Y more so than before. Um, still won't be perfect due to how Solana works, which is a continuous auctions as opposed to the discrete ones, which Jito and Ethereum enable. Uh, but it's definitely uh, a step in the right direction. And um, what's interesting, though, is now there's much more attention uh, being given to this topic, right? Like there's guys like Tarun and like Eugene writing, uh, uh, making suggestions on multidimensional fee markets, right? Uh, and, and so it's actually a really, really interesting problem. Uh, and it's a very difficult problem, by the way, right? Like people love to say things like, oh, well, Solana can't even stay up. It's like, well, you know, uh, continuous block <laughs> propagation is an insanely difficult problem and it enables for a lot better performance. And if we can make some leeway or progress in solving that, then, you know, there's no reason why other blockchains couldn't also take it and all blockchains would be more performant, right? Um, so... Anyway, I, I rambled for a bit there, but really what I would do is if you want to understand more about this, watch the episode we did with Eugene, uh, read the Umber research post. Helios also has a few posts on this um, and just gather all the information and then start looking at the SIMD and, and, and contribute to the, to the conversation. No, that, that was great, Murd. And if I was to just quickly summarize that, you know, I'm a user. I pay a transaction fee on a blockchain, and that, uh, in the case of Solana, that is broken into two pieces: the signer fee and the priority fee. The signer fee is an attempt to measure the computational resources required by the validators to execute these transactions. It was this getting the hash of the signer was kind of like this beefy process, and, and that was you know what seemed to be the right way to do it. It doesn't really seem like that's the best way forward. You kind of want to. I think it seems to be a direction of pushing towards the actual computational units uh, used. Uh, compute units used in a transaction. Um, so we have this this base fee that doesn't really uh, capture the amount of resources required in a transaction. And then you have the priority fee, which is really the user's expression of how badly they want to get in the block. Um, it's kind of like the two pieces of the transaction. And after the transaction fee is paid, it hits this scheduler. And this scheduler's one job is just to say, let's execute the transaction. I'll assign you to a thread and we'll go from there. And that scheduler is functional, but not optimized. It's kind of where it seems like a fair definition would be. Uh, and that creates this like, the, what, you, what is called jitter, jitter and basically some randomness in the uh, assignment process for these transactions, um, which ultimately those things combined creates this incentive to spam, uh, which creates all of these problems when a regular person who just wants to like say, make a swap through Jupiter, you know, now they have these problems where they can't get their transaction executed uh, and they send a transaction and it fails and they send a transaction and it fails. And that leads to poor UX. Um, and so ultimately, there's like these these proposals on how to fix it. One is, uh, you know, 
as going through the ideas of economic back pressure, um, which is kind of seems like the pushback there is this is more of a band aid, uh, and it's like treating the symptom, not the disease, is kind of the the summary of the the pushback that I've seen uh, versus the other treating the disease is what how you, what you mentioned is rebuilding this entire networking protocol, uh, which of course is no small task either. So. That's kind of where it seems like the state of things are today. And I, I just liked how you mentioned how some people still like look at that and they get like upset or, or you know, start talking shit. But that's the reality of this industry. So I, I try not to take that too seriously because, you know, when you look at the state of like Ethereum mainnet today, the, you know, the first smart contract, contract, smart contracting platform to scale really Um and it is now a slow moving beast. Anatoly often describes this as like the multi billion dollar ship. You kind of have to be very sure before you change course. And that all makes sense to me. Uh, but, you know, when you look at transacting on mainnet today, it's hundreds of dollars to execute a swap. Like that is mind numbing. It's very frustrating. And it just really goes to show the challenge of getting blockchain freeze right. Like you're building this permissionless system that anybody can do as they please to. And when that exists, People will exploit value. That is the whole point. <laughs> like, not the whole point, but that is going to happen. Uh, again, MEV is inevitable. It's right in line with that, that statement. And um, it's just interesting to kind of see those dynamics. So I personally would rather, when I like look at those two landscapes, Solana seems more equipped to solve their fee problem or get it in a more functional place uh, than like Ethereum mainnet. Because, I mean, Ethereum is really solving that through L2s. Um, and it'll be very interesting. 4844 is right around the corner. Uh, I'm curious to get your thoughts on like the Ethereum mainnet side of things. And then maybe we can dive in on uh, the latest round of numbers through 4844. I think maybe before talking about what 4844, like my thoughts on 4844, it'd be useful to explain kind of what it is to Solana folks from just a naive uh, uh, overview. Uh, so like... For people who are just totally unfamiliar with it, maybe uh, I'll, I'll do my best here. But so you can kind of think of a blockchain scaling in two directions. There's a monolithic or integrated direction, and there's a modular direction. And monolithic, let's say, is something like a Solana where the blockchain does a bunch of different functions. But most importantly, it does the execution of transactions um uh uh the the verification of those transactions or like the execute of the execution results um and it does this by making data available to all the nodes such that the nodes can verify what happened and then the settling of everything right uh reaching consensus etc so solana does all those things on its own um not everybody agrees with this approach in fact i think probably most of the industry now doesn't and so now there's this other approach called the modular approach where they separate out the different functions of the blockchain into different parts. Um, maybe one part does data availability, maybe one does execution, and then the other does settlement uh, or consensus. And um, so what, what Ethereum has done or what, yeah, like uh, what, what Ethereum has done is they basically said like, okay, we're going to uh, actually uh, execute these transactions off chain. Right, we're not going to do them on the L1. That is Ethereum. We're going to do them in this other place, and that other place is going to be on 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 the on the rollup, right? So, like when you use something like a, uh, I guess an Arbitrum or Optimism, what, what's what's happening is you're doing these transactions, you're submitting them directly to this rollup sequencer, um, and um, the sequencer you know is you know taking these transactions, it's rolling them up, and then batch posting them to the Ethereum L1, and the reason it's called an optimistic rollup is because it's optimistic that nothing bad happened uh, off chain, like nothing funky happened off chain. If you think something funky happened, you can submit a fraud proof and you can uh, uh, contest that that actually didn't happen. And you can kind of help with the integrity of those off chain interactions. Uh, just going to completely ignore the fact that actually most optimistic rollups don't even have that part working. Um, that's what happens. Okay. Uh, now, in the case of like an optimistic rollup, though, for those people to submit the fraud proof, that's something like the rollup sequencer is behaving properly, they need to have the data made available to them so that they can use that data to prove something bad happened, right? That data was published. Okay. Now, currently, that data is published on Ethereum the L1. And again, as we talked about, those fees are kind of crazy. 
Um, now, this is a slightly different type of fee, but there, it's still quite high. And this is the ultimate bottleneck because as long as those fees remain constrained, uh, and uh, well, not just the fees, there's also bandwidth issues, um, your scalability suffers. You're ultimately bottlenecked. And so Ethereum has said, like, okay, actually, we're going to change our mainnet to help roll up scale. Um, and we're going to have these, um, how to not get too technical here, uh, uh, like blobs, these, these, these places where you can just post roll up data. Okay. And the TLDR here is this makes the data cheaper. Okay. For the roll ups. So the, the, the roll ups can post more data in a cheaper way. And this can now help scalability of those roll ups. They can do higher TPS at lower fees. Okay. Um, and the idea is, of course, as this goes live, the gap between something like a monolithic chain, like a Solana, and these optimists, like these rollups, is now closed uh, or, 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 or smaller than it was before, right? Like before, even Arbitrum or Optimism, when they would get congested, you would still see fees of like up to $8, $10, which isn't, which is about three orders of magnitude worse than Solana still. And so now the question is, okay, once it does go live, what does that look like? How many TPS will these things do? And what will the fees be? And one of the reasons why it's hard to predict this is because it's a market. And if we could predict markets, we would all be rich. Uh, but you need to understand demand and how the demand will be used, how it will be distributed, et cetera. Um, and so it's kind of an open question. The first, I, I think I saw like Vance from like a framework say something like there'll be like a thousand rollups a, a few months ago. And then John Charb did the math and was like, actually, it's not going to really result in anything that crazy. Uh, like, the, it's not that going to it's not going to be that much more available or 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 or, or improvement. And maybe you should use Celestia for DA because that's going to be much better improvement than using Ethereum mainnet. Uh, so we don't know the, what the numbers look like, but I think you have some latest numbers from the Optimism guys. Yeah, no, that was a great flag. I, I love the explanation there. I think that sets a great context for the rest of this discussion. And uh, I just love how it's called blobs. <laughs> uh, such a dumb thing, but it, it's the like the definition for un, an unstructured data set, which that's exactly what a blob is. You're just throwing data on there. So you say, hey, store this for me. Um, you know, when that fraud window is open, I'm going to need this data. Uh, and after that, like, I don't really care what happens to it. So that's, that's like literally what a blob is. Um, but... So yeah, they're just like sidecars on blocks, and for, in the case of Ethereum, um, and so the Optimism team, led by I think it was Mike, Michael Silbert's effort, uh, did a great job with like kind of like breaking down the numbers and saying, okay, you know, we're going to take an, our, the market expectation about um, the price of blobs post. Uh, when this upgrade goes live uh, and then kind of just like use that data to back into what like transaction or typical transaction activity would cost on optimism uh, and similar chains of that construction. And it was a lot better than I originally expected. Um, it's actually ex based on their current round of expectations. It's actually going to be subsent transactions, which is shocking. I was not anticipating that. And again, this is as Mer pointed out, this is predicting markets, and that like we would we wouldn't be here if we could all do that perfectly. Um, the one issue I I take with their construction of this model is they used the a uh, I'm totally blanking on the name poly market uh, the like live, yeah poly market they used the poly market uh, like betting field that was you know what is the market expectation going to be uh, for the price of a blob after one month after 4844 goes live and there's just like not a lot of liquidity on this betting market and so it's like oh really is that what they did yeah yeah which isn't great and like i think there was four different options and they all had like less than 10k of liquidity so it wasn't great but that's why it, it kind of triggered me into saying okay well i don't necessarily agree with that but like i've never i haven't done the math like i don't know what i expect and so the target amount of blobs per block, so an individual chunk of uh, an individual sidecar attached to a block is three, and the maximum size is 0.125 of a megabyte. And so I was like, okay, with that information, you know, we can get to somewhere that let's just see how many rollups have been historically posting to blocks um, per block, right? If it's 
Each role would use their own blob. Uh, you could do some interesting blob sharing strategies, but that would be super complex. Uh, so let's ignore that for now. Uh, so how many roles are posting to blocks and how much data are they posting to blocks uh, right now? And so I put together a quick Dune query using most of the, I just powered by Rollup Economics, a great data set that Kofi has put together available for free on Dune. Uh, taking a look at those two things, right? The amount of Rollups that wanted a blob uh, per block on average and the amount of data total posted uh, to those blobs. And so, as I mentioned, the the target would be three blobs per block. And if there are more rollups that want to access to that, um, if there are more more than three blobs per block, then the price of the blob will increase. And if there are less than three, then it, it would decrease down to some minimum four. And so, on average, uh, there really aren't. It's it's more of like one and a half block rollups want wanting blob space per block right now, uh, which that kind of surprised me. I would have guessed it would have been higher. Um, and there is the idea of induced demand here, right? If we do get subsent, subsent transactions, this will very quickly increase <laughs> because there will be more user activity, which now creates more blob space. And the capacity isn't that high um, because on the data side, uh, 0.125 megabytes like isn't a ton per blob, but that's about so point, 0.375 would be filling up all three of those blobs. And you don't need to fill up a whole blob, uh, but you, if like, again, you'd be very complex for two rollups to share one blob. Um, and you we're really not even seeing anywhere near that amount of data being posted right now. Uh, I, it's, it's about like, it's, le it's less than 0.1. It's, I think on average, it's somewhere around 0 0.1, uh, like 0 0.8, 0 0.9 uh, being posted per block. And so that kind of made me think, okay, maybe on the initial onset, that expectation of subset transactions is right. But I do think the idea of induced demand will hit quickly here, right? Everyone's going to be wanting to transact. Yeah, uh, I think that's. Um, I think that's well said. I, like you know, uh, th there's so many different dynamics here. Like there's also Eigen DA, which is going to go live, right? There's Celestia, which which has been around for a bit, but there's also these roll up as a service providers that are starting to maybe uh, uh, do more as well. And so it's like, okay, which roll ups? And then you know, there's uh, Arbitrum Optic Opt Up Opt. What was it? Orbit? Uh, Arbitrum Orbit, yep. That's yeah. like building out your own, um, that's like a framework for building L2s. Yeah, uh, you know, Polygon Avail. And there's just so many different dynamics here of who goes where, who posts data where. And then, you know, even Near has DA now. And um, <laughs> like, it's just, there's so many different variables that I don't think, you know, we'll just wait out, see what happens. Um I think but what I'll say is I think it's gonna be quite a challenge for everybody to get close to Solana's fee levels currently. Um that I think seems to be just a a a constant. Like they can maybe get closer by an order of magnitude, but I don't think the difference or the delta would ever or not ever, but for the foreseeable future be within the same order of magnitude, right? Like a, a stat that I like to reference a lot is that Solana has about three X less nodes than Ethereum. But it's also five million times cheaper, right? Like, and about a hundred times uh, more throughput, one hundred thirty times more throughput. So, like, you know, if you compare things by orders of magnitude, you know, one of these variables has one order of magnitude difference. The other, like, about five to six orders of magnitude difference. And so, like, is the price that you're paying for those transactions worth it for that delta in security? Right. Like if you just think of it from a pure business perspective and given how early crypto is, I don't think so. Not yet. And obviously that's why I build on Solana as well. But, you know, I, I, I think I think I'll get there. So, um, well, I, I think the the thing with 4844 and I, I remember like a weird prediction thread about this uh, or, or a long form. I don't do threads anymore. Um, and uh, red life. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and and I think what will happen though is when it goes live, there'll be like a massive narrative on CT, and people will be like, "Oh, it went live. Oh, like the fees are going low, whatever." And then soon enough, as the hype keeps keeps picking up momentum, reality will start becoming more and more detached from what's being discussed. Um, and I think what what I'll, what that'll do is drive attention to like uh, Eigen Layer and Celestia and these other DA layers. But then it's like, will DA become commoditized, right? 
Um, yes. And yeah, I think most people think yes. And at that point, how do you stand out? Um, well, maybe with execution, but who does execution quite well? Well, you know, Monad, Solana, Sui, Aptos. Um, so it should be fun. Yeah, it's really interesting. Real quick on this, the the, uh, the Monad Monad is getting the uh, the Ethereum alignment nod, which is really funny because it's just a giant monolith chain. It, it's like Solana, but it, it's in EVM, <laughs> which is kind of <laughs> funny. But um, to pivot back to the DA discussion, it, it's interesting, right? Like, so we mentioned that the target number of blobs per block is three, and that equates to zero point three seven five megabytes per block. That's a target number. And again, if it goes above this, it's the price increases. If it goes below this, the price decreases. And that is funny to see because you get a block every four seconds, or excuse me, a block every 12 seconds uh, versus uh, Celestia's every 15 seconds. So let's just pretend that's the same real quick. Um, Celestia supports eight megabytes per block. And that is a number that they probably would feel comfortable increasing if they got to the point of having eight megabytes per data. Right now, they do not nearly have that. Um, every day, they're at about 0.1% capacity. I've built a great dashboard here for the listeners rather than the viewers. I'm just tracking who's using Celestia and in what capacity. Um, nobody's really using Celestia at scale yet. It's still a pretty small, small apples. Uh, there's a gaming roll-up called Hokum. That is an actually an L3 on base, I believe. Uh, that is the leading DA poster, and it's really just like it's this yellow down here. It's this like large spurts of posting DA. Um, How does Mantis that work? A, L3 what, on base that posts data to Celestia. What even is that? It starts to hurt your brain. I'll, I'll be honest. Trust me. <laughs> um, but it's interesting because you know per megabyte you're paying you know it, it's a first price auction market so they can change based on what you bid uh, which isn't a great fee pricing mechanism but it's really not a problem right now so you're paying roughly between forty and twenty and forty cents per megabyte uh, and if you back out the math on the on the blobs it's closer to like thirteen bucks so even after this upgrade you know, Ethereum will very much so not be the the cheapest option and so it's gonna like have this weird competing factor with eigen da it already is competing with celestia and you mentioned you know right. avail and near it's 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 gonna get really interesting um and again it's like do you even need this like this many da solutions one of the numbers on this dashboard celestia has only been alive for a couple of months and again it's not really being used at scale yet um we, like there's roll up as a service providers building conduits doing a phenomenal job. They have most of the chains that are live on Celestia, but eight thousand dollars in total DA costs over four no probably closer to seven months now no five months somewhere between three and seven months uh, eight thousand dollars in people paying for DA and you're right like is it going to get commoditized? And my answer would be it is. It already is. It's it's dirt cheap for DA. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, funny. Like uh, you also just like nonchalantly mentioned that it competes with like Ethereum, competes with like Celestia and Eigen DA and it, like uh, Ethereum DA. And when I said that, I got yelled at by like literally everybody, and they're like, "Oh no, it doesn't compete. They they help each other." It's like, okay, they help each other, sure, but Solana also helps Ethereum, and that it evangelizes crypto, right? I mean, sure, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's you're interchanging where you post data, and you're paying a different token. It's competing, okay. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, and this, this world of thousands of rollups or hundreds of rollups, whatever, all kind of goes back to the same point that I make just religiously at this point, which is why are you building these things without needing them? Okay. Right. Like, uh, the, the way tech works is you first need to have people wanting the thing, right. And then you make it accessible. And then because that's how technology works in all aspects. Uh, in fact, I'm going to do some homework today and try to understand or see in what cases in history has it been such that tech is made accessible first just for the sake of it while getting some people rich uh, instead of the other way around where it's made to be such that people want it first and then you make it cheaper. Um, you know, I, I just... It, it it boggles my mind because the problem with this is you, it's not like you're just making like when, every time you introduce a roll up, you're making something more complex. You're introducing another assumption and 
people like to say like, okay, well, this is just like cloud. This is just like Web2 where you can abstract these things, AWS and stuff. It's like, no, it's not, okay? The cloud is the cloud. This is a different thing because these things have trust assumptions that rely on each other. And every time you introduce something new, you've completely changed the trust assumptions or security assumptions. And the problem with a system like this is it's only as strong as the weakest assumption there, right? Like obviously, literally, this the chain is as strong as its weakest link is an age-old uh, uh, saying, and it's just totally true in this case, right? If you have this very, very secure two networks, but the bridge is like super weak or something, well, where do most of the hacks today happen? They happen on the bridges, okay? Like it's, there's just, and Vitalik has a post on this, right? Like he thinks the, ch- the future will be like multi-chain, but not necessarily cross-chain, right? Um, and so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of inconsistency here. And I, I really do think the simpler we keep it at the base layer as much as we can first before doing all these weird things would be better, but you know, free markets, man. Uh, yeah. People do will do what they want. No kidding. I I will. Uh, I'll back up Celestia for their creation of their product because, <clears throat> excuse me, it is a hundred x improvement in the current state of, of affairs and paying for a DA on mainnet. Now, do I think it's a mistake that we're creating all these roles before we solve for interoperability? Absolutely. Do I agree with you that? You can't abstract away the chain from the user because the risk assumptions change so greatly depending on what train you're on. Absolutely. Those those problems drive me nuts. And what makes me even more mad as a data analyst is I love looking at on-chain data and that isn't physically possible in a world of a million chains. Like you can't, in, the indexers cannot handle that. It's, it's like there's no viable solution there. Um, and now that you're introducing more trust assumptions at the data layer, like we're already kind of forced to trust a, a Dune or a flip side or an Allium, uh, as well as like a quick node or whoever's running the nodes behind the data providers. Like we're already, there's already like two degrees of separation between you and, you know, this beautiful transparent on-chain data. Uh, and now if we go add all these new chains, what's going to have to happen is the chains themselves will like, Imagine where you launch through a roll-up as a service provider and you open up the deploy page and it's, I'll take an OP stack chain using Celestia for DA and I want you to post my data to Dune. Like now I'm <laughs> trusting this roll-up as a service provider to index their chains and then tr- like send the data to Dune reliably. Like it's this weird hodgepodge and it's just like why every time... So I was I was doing some real homework on Celestia the other day. I was in the early days of their podcast with like gigabrain people that I respect deeply. Um, they've had some great minds on some of those early podcasts and, and talks. And a lot of the not a, like almost every single time you hear why are you building this, it's because the the response starts with you cannot scale the base layer. Like that's it. It starts there. And then, oh, the, these other properties are interesting too. It was never this like customization angle that now gets pushed of like, oh, you can tweak different things and optimize different things. Like like part of that is because you probably couldn't like imagine that you were going to be able to get this level of customization. But the other side of that is it kind of seems like we can scale some base layers, maybe not for the world of global operation, but definitely for like the next wave of, of, of innovation and, and users. Like it does seem like we're kind of in a point where we can do that. And to me, What's better, a world of one million rollups or like seven Solanas? It's like it's not even close. Give me seven Solanas all day. Yeah, and I think like the one thing which I can see why Celestia wouldn't want to do from a business perspective, but I think would be better for the industry. Just you know, two or three big rollups. That's what you need. You don't yep. need. And Anatoly will say like he doesn't fear a thousand rollups in any way. What he, what, he, what he would fear is one huge roll-up uh, that can, you know, like if you're using Celestia and you're a roll-up and this roll-up handles like all of L2 traffic, that's like a pretty worthy competition. And that starts getting very interesting. It makes things for everybody for, for everybody simple. But like now the incentives that you've set up with this customization and like everybody gets a roll-up thing are maybe a bit premature, uh, I guess time will tell. I could I could be totally wrong, but I think like one big Arbitrum roll up, right? Like Arbitrum one, and then like one other massive roll up, and then maybe use Celestia for DA. I think that's quite good, and I think that's 
a lot of expressive uh, uh, expressiveness for developers, but also simplicity for users. And ultimately, the more users we can get, the better it's going to be for literally everybody. So the yeah. problem there is like rollups have been so focused, especially the Ethereum rollups on EVM equivalents, right? Like that was such a pitch to get this type one ZK EVM where you could have this perfect replication of Ethereum, uh, but in a rollup. And now it's sort of like, is the EVM the best VM out there? And do we want to like live and die by that? And, you know, obviously the work that Solana has done on the SVM, um, the move VM is becoming more popular as well. Avalanche is soon to release their hyper SDK, which I am personally very excited about. Uh, and it's like, shit, like if there's better VMs, like that's where you're going to get your performance boosts from, um, you know, reworking the database to stop using the perturb. Patricia Merkel tree that that Ethereum uses is a huge problem. I don't want to get too technical, I guess, but there's a lot of like the EVM was first to prove this thing could work, and people have iterated on it and built very fast machines. And it's like rollups haven't historically focused on that. I think Eclipse is probably one of the first rollups to really think about performance as a rollup, uh, and they're porting over the SVM into. I call it either the Optimus Prime or the Frankenstein, right? They're using the SVM for execution. That's sort of best in class these days. They're using uh, Ethereum for settlement, or that's where they're putting their main bridge contract because that's where the most liquidity is today. So it's best in class. Uh, and then they're using Celestia for DA. Again, best in class, cheapest DA solution. So um, that's really going to be this proof of concept is, will there be this big, scary roll-up that you just describe is, can you get a get maximum performance out of, of a roll-up? And if so, like what does that construction look like? And is it repeatable? Um, that's kind of how I'm thinking right now. Yeah. I think an SVM or move VM with I think like Solana DA or Celestia DA works. Um, that's just gonna be that's just gonna work. And then you can use Ethereum for settlements. There's a lot of issues there to solve, but you know, um, there's a lot of teams also dedicated to solving this now as well. And yeah, Avalanche has some interesting work here, like the high press DK. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap this one up, Mert. Um, thanks again for listening, guys. This was another fun episode, and we will be back with you next week. Cheers. 